Hello everyone and welcome to today's keynote presentation, modulation of the CSPG receptor, PTP Sigma, to enhance neuro repair. This webinar is part of the 10th Annual Neuroscience Virtual Conference, and I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive, and we encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using our live chat feature during the presentation. You can find this live chat located at the right of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you want during this presentation. To do so, simply type them in to the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Now, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on that help desk located at the bottom of your screen within the navigation bar or from the lobby. And finally, as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on that continuing education credits link located at the abstract window below the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Without further ado, I now present today's speaker, Dr. Mark DePaul, the Director of Research at NerveGen Pharma. For a complete biography of our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the left of your screen. Dr. DePaul, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Uh, thank you, Susie, for the introduction, and thank you, LabRoots, for organizing today's meeting and for the invite to speak. Uh, today, I'm very excited to introduce to you uh, the company NerveGen and our technology that we believe can treat any type of nervous system damage, whether it is occurring from a traumatic injury, such as spinal cord injury, due to disease processes, such as stroke or Alzheimer's disease, or in the peripheral, such as peripheral nerve injuries. So a little bit about the company. Um, so we are developing a brand new class of therapeutics targeting a brand new receptor, uh, which I'll go into in subsequent slides. Uh, and this new class of therapeutics is being developed to target repair following nervous system damage. The therapeutic that we are developing is called MVG291, and it targets the receptor protein tyrosine phosphatase sigma, or PTB sigma. And PTB sigma has been shown to be involved in many different repair processes, such as remyelination, regeneration, and plasticity. It also has effects within the immune system on innate immune activation. And we're using our compound, we have investigated several different models of nervous system damage that is, and have resulted in clinically relevant improvements in many different functional areas, including gross motor function, sensory function, autonomic function, and cognitive function. So we are in a clinical stage biotech company. Uh, we are currently in a phase one trial in which we're investigating our compounds in healthy volunteers, which began last year and we'll read out uh, later this year. And we plan to begin uh, three phase two trials in spinal cord injury, Alzheimer's disease, and multiple sclerosis. So now I'd like to go a little bit into what our technology is and how it's able to enhance repair following different types of nervous system damage. So our technology is based around the discovery that chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, or CSPGs, are present in the brain and in the spinal cord and inhibit nervous system repair. CSPGs are an extracellular matrix molecule that consists of a core protein, which is shown here in yellow. And then off of the core protein are these sulfated sugar side chains. And these sugar side chains, which are shown here in red, are the inhibitory parts of the protein. Uh, CSPGs are known to have several biological functions in the uh, healthy adult individual. Uh, first, they play a structural component in many different body parts. They are major components of cartilage, and it's one of the reasons why cartilage is uh, not innervated very well, uh, both from a nervous system standpoint and a vascular standpoint, because these CSPGs help inhibit that type of innervation and growth into the cartilage tissue. Uh, giving hints its, into its role within the central nervous system injury. It also plays a role in early development where uh, CSPGs will act as corridors to help guide neurons and axons away from areas where they shouldn't be and towards areas to where they should be. And then in the adult nervous system, they play a role in a structure called the perineuronal net, which is pictured here on the right. A perineuronal net is this lattice-like structure that surrounds the synapses and dendrites and cell bodies of many different neurons, it helps maintain synaptic integrity. 
Um, and I'll go into a little bit how the perineural net plays a role in recovery and how it inhibits plasticity of the central nervous system. And so those are the roles of chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans in the normally functioning individual, but also has a role following nervous system damage. So CSPGs are upregulated around areas of damage in the forming scar, known as the glial scar that occurs. And I have down at the bottom two examples of this occurring. Uh, the first is with a uh, lysolethacin model or an LPC model of demyelination, in which a detergent is administered to the central nervous system and it breaks down the myelin. And you can see uh, CSPGs are labeled in red in the animal that received the LPC injection. There's a very large upregulation of CSPGs around the area of demyelination. And the sham control, which did not receive the, the detergent, uh, received a control injection of saline. Uh, but you can see in the middle of the image there, there's actually an upregulation of CSPGs where the needle uh, penetrated the central nervous system in order to deliver that vehicle. So even very small injuries within the CNS can cause a upregulation of CSPGs around areas of damage. And they're also found around areas of damage due to neurodegenerative processes. For example, the example I have here is an Alzheimer's plaque in a, a patient. Uh, the white in the very center of the image is a plaque, and then the dark black around it are CSPGs which surround the plaque. Um, now, CSPGs are also upregulated following injury away from the sites of injury within the perineuronal nets. Uh, so, for example, if you injure your spinal cord in the thoracic area, which is around the area of your rib cages, there's an upregulation of CSPGs in the cervical area, which is by your neck, or in the lumbar area, which is more by your belly. And so, this is a little bit separate from what is observed within the glial scar, uh, where the CSPGs are a component of the scar. These CSPGs are upregulated around the perineural nets, uh, which, which surround synapses and cell bodies and help to maintain those synaptic connections. So by upregulation around CSPGs within the injury site, CSPGs can inhibit regeneration around areas of damage. And by upregulation of CSPGs within the perineural net away from the areas of damage, CSPGs inhibit plasticity that could uh, potentially allow the central nervous system to reorganize itself to bring about functional recovery. And I want to take a little bit of time to introduce this idea of plasticity and the perineural net because it's central to understanding how our compound works. Um, well, first, actually, I, I do want to um, describe CSPGs in the context of the SCAR and developmental biology. Um, in this image, we have what we know, what is called a spot assay. And for those of you that drink coffee, if you ever spilled a drop of coffee on your desk and let it dry, the coffee dries in a gradient where the rim is very highly concentrated. Then as you move towards the center of the rim, it becomes less and less concentrated. It's a very nice gradient of coffee. Something similar happens following an injury in the central nervous system where you have very high concentration of CSPGs at the epicenter of the injury. Then as you move away from the injury, the CSPGs begin to decrease. And this gradient causes a certain response in neurons that are regenerating into the, that inhibitory rim as opposed to during development where CSPGs are laid down more of a wall where it's either there or not there. And by uh, drying CSPGs on a cover slip, they dry very similar to how a coffee drop dries on your desk. And so we're able to model both the developmental display of CSPGs to axons, as well as the, the glial scar or the injury display of the gradient to axons. And so in this image, the, uh, the neurons that are cultured at the top of the image um, approach the spot as, as similar to what is observed during development. And those neurons that are plated at the bottom of the image pr uh, approach the spot in the gradient fashion. So the, the spot is outlined in the dotted white line there. And I have a couple arrows pointing at a neuron uh, that's outside the spot that's growing towards the spot. And you can see the axon, which is at the arrowhead, as it approaches the CSPG wall, it turns and grows alongside of it, which is very different than how the neurons that are approaching the CSPGs from within the spot itself. The neurons that are approaching the CSPGs within the spot, they become stuck and embedded within the CSPG gradients and they become dystrophic. And they will remain embedded and stuck in that CSPG gradient indefinitely. And this is very reminiscent to what we observe is happening following an injury within uh, animals as well as people where regenerating axons become stuck within the gradient of CSPGs and become dystrophic. And you can observe these dystrophic axons in the lesion environments decades after the injury has occurred. 
So CSPGs can also inhibit plasticity of the central nervous system. Uh, the example I have here is a neuron on the left is trying to make a synapse with the second order neuron there on the right. So it's able to extend an axon and get very close to that neuron, but due to the perineuronal net, which surrounds the uh, second order neurons, cell body and dendrites, the axon is never able to penetrate the perineuronal net and make contact with the second order neuron in order to form a functional synapse. Now, there's a couple of different ways we can remove the perineuronal net. There's an enzyme called chondroitinase, which is a bacterial derived enzyme that degrades CSPGs. And if you degrade the CSPGs of the perineuronal net, that is sufficient to allow the neuron access to the second order neuron to make a functional synapse. And so this concept is known as plasticity, the rewiring of the central nervous system to bring about a novel function. Uh, and it can be used in times of injury to allow rewiring of the central nervous system around the injury site to allow the information to flow around areas of damage. And so I have an example here, um, an injury, in this case, it's a spinal cord injury uh, where there's a damaged neuron and most spinal cord injuries are incomplete, meaning that there are some neurons that are able to bypass the injury site. And so by enhancing plasticity, we can allow the damaged neurons to make new connections with neurons that are able to bypass the injury site and allow the spared neurons that are able to, to project below the level of injury to make new connections to neurons that were de-innervated due to the injury site. And through this process known as plasticity, we can reroute information around the injury site to bring about functional recovery. CSPGs have been shown to be pathologically um, involved and associated with several different diseases and conditions in people. Uh, some of the examples that we're interested in as a company include Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, stroke, stroke and traumatic brain injury. And in all these cases, there are uh, examples that CSPGs are pathologically involved in human patients. Now, CS, the inhibitory role of CSPGs has been known for quite some time. Um, this is a little bit of a dense slide, but I want to go over the timeline of regeneration failure within the, the central nervous system. So back in the early 1900s, Ramoni Cajal identified that axons within the central nervous system failed to regenerate. And it wasn't until uh, the late 80s that CSPGs were appreciated to be a major player in regeneration failure. They're first shown to be a major component of the glial scar in spinal cord injury. Uh, in the late 80s, as well as a prominent component of the perineuronal net. And then throughout the 90s, CSPGs were identified in a number of neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, uh, Parkinson's, uh, to name a few, uh, multiple sclerosis as well. And then uh, around the late 90s, uh, investigators started utilizing an enzyme called chondroitinase, which has the ability to digest CSPGs. And they found that when they digested CSPGs, they're able to bring about recovery in a number of different uh, conditions of the central nervous system, the first being spinal cord injury, which is shown in 2001. Uh, so this research carried on for the, for the next decade or so, and it wasn't until 2009 that the receptor mediating many of these negative effects was finally discovered as PTP sigma, or protein tyrosine phosphatase sigma. Um, so the effects of CSPGs were known for over 20 years before the receptor mediating these effects were known. And now that the receptor was identified, we now had a target that we could a drug to be able to modulate its activity and, and inhibit the effects of CSPGs. And so my team and I um, put, uh, went together and developed the predecessor to NerveGen's technology, uh, which we published in 2015, uh, known as MVG291, and is the foundation of what NerveGen's technology is based on. And so now I wanna take a couple moments to describe the receptor and the biology that it's involved in. So PTP sigma is a transmembrane receptor. It has an extracellular component that will bind to proteoglycans. glycans. Uh, the examples I gave here is heparin sulfate proteoglycan and conjoint sulfate proteoglycan. And based on the proteoglycan family it binds to, it either has an activation effect on the receptor or an inhibition effect on the receptor. And the activation and inhibition of the receptor is dependent on the dimerization status of the receptor. When CSPGs bind to the receptor, it causes the receptor to monomerize, which reveals a phosphatase pocket and activates downstream 
second messenger systems that inhibit axonal growth, such as ROE, and it, it inhibits growth-associated pathways, which can activate growth, such as AKT and ERK. So P2P Sigma is able to signal through a second messenger system to control general growth-related uh, response in the cell. And it also has effects locally within the growth cone itself. Uh, the example I have outlined here is the effects on autophagy. So autophagy is the cell's ability to recycle proteins, and it's needed to, to recycle these proteins in order to make new proteins to, to continue the growth process. If you halt autophagy, the cell is no longer able to recycle these proteins. And in order for autophagy to occur, the autophagosome, which contains the components that need to be recycled, need to fuse with the lysosome in order to degrade the proteins. This step is dependent on a protein called cortactin, which is a direct substrate of P2P sigma. When P2P sigma is activated through binding of CSPGs, it causes cortactin to be dephosphorylated and inactivated, which causes a halt in the fusion step of autophagy, um, which causes then the growth cone to become dystrophic. And so uh, this slide is, is meant to illustrate that P2P sigma has both a global uh, second messenger system effect on the cell growth associated pathways, as well as local effects on uh, pathways that are regulating the growth cone at the growing axon tip. So similar to CSPGs, uh, P2P sigma is also upregulated following injury. The two examples I have here, uh, one is a traumatic injury and spinal cord injury. You can appreciate around the lesion area, which is in panel B on the, on the uh, left two panels, there's a high upregulation of P2P sigma around the area of damage. Um, and then in A, uh, which is far away from the lesion, you can see a much lower expression of the, of the receptor. So P2P sigma is expressed at basal levels, and when it comes in contact with a damaged environment, it upregulates. Uh, this is also true for neurodegenerative diseases. And the case I have here is an EAE model of multiple sclerosis, which uses an, the immune system to attack myelin sheaths within the central nervous system. And we see a very large increase of P2P sigma within the CNS in these EAE mice specifically within oligodendrocytes. So how do we modulate the receptor? Uh, the receptor is, uh, as I mentioned before, the receptor is inactivated when it's in its dimerized form. And part of the regulatory domain is this domain known as the wedge domain that's responsible for activation and inhibition of the receptor. So our drug uh, takes nature's method of modulating the receptor, the wedge domain, and attaches a cell-penetrating TAT domain to this wedge domain. And so we, uh, so our drug is a peptide mimetic of the wedge domain of the P2P sigma receptor attached to a cell-penetrating cell peptide sequence. And this allows the peptide to pass through the blood-brain barrier as well as through cell membranes to allow the drug to enter the cell to elicit its effects on P2P sigma. And we find that when we add our drug to cells, uh, we reverse the effects of CSPG signaling. Uh, for example, um, CSPGs cause an increase in row A and a decrease in AKT and ERK signaling. And when we treat the cells with our compounds, we inhibit row A activation and increase AKT and ERK, which leads to an increase in axonal growth, remyelination, and plasticity. Now, throughout this talk, I'll be talking about a few different molecules. Um, they are all very similar. Uh, MVG291-R is our rodent version of the uh, uh, compound. It, it is a peptide mimetic of the rodent wedge domain. MVG291 is the human mimetic of the wedge domain in our clinical trial drug. Uh, the two drugs differ by a single amino acid, and we've tested both versions against human cells and both versions against rodent cells, and they both have the same pharmacological effect. Um, in the preclinical research, a number of academic labs have published research using our compounds, and they refer to it as ISP, or intracellular sigma peptide. And so if you look at the literature, um, our drug is described as ISP, and there's a few graphs in here that label it as ISP. Um, and if you, uh, going back to the coffee drop experiment, uh, which I showed you a couple slides ago, uh, you can see the effects of the neurons when we apply our compounds in that same study. Uh, so at the top here in, in the left panel is the same slide I showed you a couple slides ago where the neurons are inhibited from crossing that inhibitory gradient. When we add the compound to the neurons in the spot assay, the neurons are able to ignore those CSPGs and grow across that inhibitory rim, ignoring those CSPGs. Um, so as I mentioned before, our, our drug has multiple modes of action. 
Uh, we believe that plasticity is a major driver of the effects that we're seeing. We also observe significant axonal regeneration around areas of damage and enhancements in remyelination. And these are the three topics I, I wish to talk on about today in more detail. But we do have other effects on the innate immune system as well as on stem cell biology. Um, I will hold those off for another discussion. PTP sigma modulation uh, using our compound has been tested in several different animal models and has led to clinically relevant functional recovery across many different areas of function. Uh, so we've investigated our compound in spinal cord injury, peripheral nerve injury, multiple sclerosis, models of optic neuritis, stroke, and cardiac ischemia. And we've seen improvements in motor function, sensory function, cognition, and autonomic function. And autonomic function specifically looking at respiration, bladder function, and cardiac pacemaking. And I'll go into a couple of these studies and show you data on how exactly our compound is eliciting the effects to bring about this recovery. Uh, the first examples I want to give are examples in which we'll show enhancements in plasticity and regeneration. Uh, so an ideal model to investigate this is the ischemic stroke model in which we elicit a stroke in one half of the brain, uh, which is identified there uh, by the the gray area of the brain taken out, known as the infarct zone. Um, and in this model, only one half of the brain is damaged, and the other half remains intact. And the area of the brain that we damage sends axons down through the brain stem into the spinal cord and innervates areas of the spinal cord. So, this, so the blue tissue section you see down below is part of the cervical spinal cord. And we can see how the non-damaged neurons respond to our compound in an injury environment by labeling those neurons using a label, in this case, BDA. And so we can inject BDA into the intact side of the brain and then follow the axons as they grow and regenerate or, or enhance their plasticity. So what we see is uh, when we stain for the non-damaged axons, uh, we see across the corpus close of a significant amount of neurons or axons that are regenerating or sprouting across the corpus callosum. Uh, which is the highway in which the axons travel from one side of the brain to the other. And then if we looked around the perinfarct zone, we see a significant amount of sprouting from those regenerating axons around the perinfarct zone. And those are quantified over here on the left. And we see a very similar sprouting within the spinal cord itself. Uh, so within the spinal cord, the, the area of the brain projects to the contralateral side of the spinal cord uh, and due to the damage, the contralateral side of the spinal cord is de-innervated because that area of the brain no longer is able to send those projections down due to the stroke. And so in response to our drug treatment, the intact side of the brain is able to send axons across the midline of the spinal cord and innervate areas that were de-innervated due to the stroke. And so this is a really elegant example of what I mean by plasticity and the ability of the brain to rewire itself in response to injury to bring about functional recovery in areas that were de-innervated due to the injury. And these sprouting effects do lead to functional benefits. Uh, so a couple of examples I have here is in sensory motor recovery in an assay called the adhesive removal test. And this is looking at longitudinally through the four weeks of treatment, uh, beginning at negative one, this is prior to treatment. And in this test, a piece of tape is placed on a rodent's paw, and the rodent needs to be able to feel the tape and remove that piece of tape, and the amount of time it takes them to remove the tape is quantified. Uh, prior to injury, the animals are very efficient at removing the tape, and then after injury, there's a significant uh, decrease in their ability to remove the tape. Treating the animals with our compound, you see a significant improvement in their ability to remove that tape, indicating they've recovered sensory motor function. The second example I want to give is an example of the cognitive recovery we observe in this is a stroke model using a study or using an assay called the Barnes maze. The Barnes maze is very similar with the more well-known Moore's water maze, uh, but it's a dry version of that where an animal is placed on a table that has many different holes cut out on the table. And one of the holes contains a platform that the animal is able to hide to, to get away from the bright lights of the room. On the walls are different visual cues, so the animal is able to orient itself and order many trials. The animal remembers where that hole is and is able to find that hole very quickly. Because of stroke, these animals have a large deficit and they make a number of errors due to uh, being unable to remember. And with our compound, we're able to enhance their ability to remember where the hole is and they're able to find that hole much quicker, making fewer errors 
suggesting that our compound is enhancing their ability to remember in this assay. Well, we've observed this sort of sprouting in many different neuron types, including uh, serotonergic sprouting and sensory neurons um, from the uh, dorsal ganglion cells. Within motor neurons, um, autonomic neurons, especially sympathetic neurons, uh, peripheral spinal neurons, and then the examples I gave above are cortical spinal and cortical cortical. Uh, the second example I want to give is some data following spinal cord injury, in which we had a mid thoracic spinal cord injury. And the top uh, longitudinal sections are showing ser serotonin staining. Um, now, serotonin regions are found within the brain, and they need to set axons down the spinal cord. A injury in the spinal cord will disrupt that the serotonin tracks, and anything below the level of injury no longer has serotonin sprouting. And this can be visualized in the images at top, where the the rostral, which means the head, is to the left, and you can see bright green staining from serotonin. Then as you move past the lesion, which is found in the middle of the uh, image, to the caudal regions, which is by the tail, you see a significant decrease in the amount of serotonin staining in the vehicle treated, which is up top. Our compound was able to significantly enhance the amount of serotonin below the level of injury. And to better image that, I have a couple representative images from the lumbar spinal cord in a, a cross-section. And you can appreciate that in the naive animal, there's a lot of serotonin within the gray matter, which is that butterfly looking shape uh, in the cross section, in, which is labeled in G. The vehicle, which is uh, saline, has almost no serotonin innervation in the lumbar section. But with our compound MVG291R, we're able to significantly increase the amount of serotonin sprouting in that lumbar area of the spinal cord, showing that we're enhancing regeneration and sprouting of the serotonin systems. And similar to stroke, uh, we see behavioral improvements in our spinal cord injury studies as well. In, in this study, we um, injured 29 um, rodents, and 21 of the 29 responded with some sort of recovery, whether that be in locomotion or bladder recovery. Um, some animals recovered locomotion, some animals recovered bladder, and some animals recovered both. Uh, the type of injury was a contusion injury, which is a, a variable. It's, it's it's a it's not a very discrete injury, so there could be different populations of neurons damaged, which would a allow different groups of different neurons responding to our treatment, which is why we likely saw uh, some benefits in, in locomotion in some animals and some benefits in bladder and other animals and other animals recovered both. Uh, but the take home here is that the vast majority responded in, in some degree or another with our treatment. And the type of improvement that we're seeing is it's actually quite substantial. Uh, this is a graph of the locomotor improvement that we're observing. Uh, and in this graph, a zero is complete paralysis, and 21 is a perfectly walking animal. Prior to injuries, all the animals are working are walking perfectly. And then following the injury, this is a significant decrease in the ability to walk. Anything below a nine is movement of the hind limbs without weight support. At a score of nine, the animals are able to, to begin bearing weight. At 10, they begin walking. And at uh, 13, they begin having frequent coordination. And so you can appreciate that in the vehicle tree that these animals on average were not even able to bear weight. And then with our treatment, these animals were able to not only bear weight and walk, their walking was coordinated and they started showing some fine motor movements such as placing their paw parallel to their body and being able to lift their tail off the ground while walking. And to give you a visual on what this looks like, um, I have a video of these two groups. On the left will be the control group in which the rat climbs up a ladder and on the right to appropriately place the um, it's able unable to appropriately place the paws on the rungs. Now in the treatment group this animal is able to use its hind legs able to support weight and it's able to make contact with the rungs appropriately. Now, the animal is not perfect walking. You may have seen it slip there, so there is some room for improvement, but it's vastly better than what has been observed in the non-treatment group. Up next, I want to show you some data in which Uh, next, I want to show you some data in which we uh, show that our compound is able to enhance remyelination, and this obviously will have implications for multiple sclerosis. Uh, currently in multiple sclerosis, there are some uh, really fantastic drugs that have come out to 
inhibits damage and inhibit the immune attacks from attacking the myelin sheaths. However, if it, an attack occurs, there's damage that occurs, and there are no drugs to currently repair the damage that occurs. And so we believe that our drug can, can work with multiple sclerosis by repairing the damage that has occurred, not necessarily inhibiting the attacks, but repairing any damage that has already occurred. And this can be done in two ways. Uh, first, obviously, uh, multiple sclerosis, there's a, a, a deficit in demyelination. We can enhance the ability of OPCs to migrate to the areas of demyelination and for oligodendrocytes to myelinate the axons. And secondly, in multiple sclerosis, it's not just a disease of myelin, but there's actual axonal damage and neuron damage as well. And so with our drug, we can either enhance the regeneration of those damaged axons to allow them to re distal targets, or we can enhance plasticity to allow the central nervous system to reorganize itself around the areas of damage to bring about recovery. The two examples I want to give here are two different models of demyelination. The first is using an LPC model in which we inject a detergent into the dorsal column. It was very similar to the image I showed in my, in my introduction. And 21 days post administration of the compounds, there's still significant demyelination within the dorsal column of the spinal cord and placebo treated animals. Whereas our compound is able to completely remyelinate the spinal cord following 21 days of administration. Uh, similarly, in an EAE model, which uses in the immune system to attack myelin sheaths within the spinal cord, we see a significant amount of remyelination in those treated with MVG291 or, as it's labeled here, ISP. Uh, we did this. At, we measured this in a few different ways. Uh, the top example was using an antibody approach, staining for myelin-based protein. And we also investigated this using electron microscopy uh, to look at the actual uh, myelin sheaths themselves as they surround the axons. And what we identified was there's an enhancement in the number of myelinated axons per field of vision, and the myelin sheaths were much thicker in the treated groups versus the non-treated group, which is measured by the G ratio. The G ratio it takes the diameter of the axon and divides it by the thickness of the myelin. So the thicker the myelin, the smaller the G ratio. And what we observed is that we have a much thicker myelin around axons that were treated with our compounds than in the axons in the animals that were treated with the vehicle control, uh, suggesting that our compound is enhancing the remyelination in the EAE model. This enhancement in remyelination does lead to clinical recovery as well. Uh, this, is in, this graph is showing the clinical recovery of the animals. And in this graph, zero is a perfectly uh, fine, non-diseased animal, and a four is uh, death. Um, and in order to elicit this model, you inoculate the animal with, uh, with agents to activate the immune system at day zero. It takes about 10 days to 12 days for the immune system to ramp up its attack on the central nervous system before the symptoms begin to occur. We try it intervening at two different time points, either at the onset of symptoms, which is indicated by the red line at about day 10, or at the peak of symptoms, which is indicated by the green line uh, at about day 16. Both intervention at the onset of symptoms or at the peak of symptoms led to repair of the central nervous system and a significant increase in the recovery in these animals. Uh, but one thing I do want to point your attention to is that for the treatment group that was treated at the onset of the symptoms, they still developed the disease. And so if you look at the slope of the lines, uh, their deficits peaked at the same height as the vehicle or those that received the treatment at later periods, suggesting that we're not affecting the disease process itself, but what we are doing is repairing the damage done by the disease. And to give you an idea of the type of recovery that we are observing in these animals, I have a video here. Uh, this video is going to go through time in which we show uh, the animal's recovery uh, over the course of And on the right is the treated group. And so you'll appreciate after about 10 days, uh, the animal begins to walk a little bit. Um, there's some movement of the hind limbs that I've seen in the treatment group versus non-treatment group. In 15 days, they begin to weight bear, uh, begin waddling, much better walking than what is observed in the ISP or in the non-treated group. Uh, 20 days, even better walking. They are starting to place their foot parallel to the body. 
Um, still not perfect, but they're able, they're quite mobile now and able to bear weight. 25 days, uh, even better walking. Now both feet are being placed parallel, good weight support. There's some tone in the tail, suggesting that it has some trunk strength, strength as well. Now, so these are the types of recoveries that we're seeing in the EAE model uh, following delivery of our compound. And so we've demonstrated remodelation in multiple disease models, not just in multiple sclerosis-like models, but in several other disease models as well, including in spinal cord injury, and as well as in peripheral nerve injuries as well. We have effects on Schwann cells. We're able to enhance their ability to remyelinate peripheral nervous system tissue as it regenerates through areas of damage. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about our thoughts regarding P2P sigma and CSPGs in Alzheimer's disease. Now, we've not investigated our compounds in an animal model of Alzheimer's disease yet. Uh, those are ongoing, but we do have data surrounding CSPGs and P2P sigma's role in Alzheimer's disease uh, that make us feel confident about approaching this disease. Um, first, I want to show you that all uh, CSPGs are associated with cognitive impairment in patients. And so this is looking at patients' brains um, in either uh, those that exhibit no cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment, or those that have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And you can appreciate that as your cognitive ability decreases, the amount of CSPGs found within the brain increases. So we believe that our compound can, and, improve Alzheimer's disease through many of the same mechanisms that has been shown to improve uh, following stroke and spinal cord injury and, and multiple sclerosis. So by enhancing axonal regeneration, remyelination, and plasticity. And there may also be a component there on the enhanced clearance of A-beta through microglial uh, interactions. So in a P2P sigma knockout mouse that was crossed with a A-beta overexpression mouse in a model of Alzheimer's, we observed the mouse that has P2P sigma knocked out to have much lower levels of A-beta. And that's true for both A-beta 40 as well as 42. We see a significant decrease in the A-beta load in those animals that, are, that have P2P sigma missing from their genome. And by knocking out P2P sigma, you're able to enhance the cognitive ability of these Alzheimer's mice as well. And in this example here, uh, the white bars are wild-type mice. These are non-diseased mice. The red bars are the mice that have Alzheimer's disease. And the blue bars are the mice that have Alzheimer's disease with P2P sigma knocked out. And in, in these two examples, I'm showing you improvements in spatial memory uh, through the Y-MACE test, as well as their ability to recognize novel objects through the novel object recognition test. In both these cases, we're able to significantly improve the cognitive ability of these mice by knocking out PTP sigma. Uh, CSPGs are also involved in the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And in the case here, I have an example of where CSPGs were degraded in the perirhinal cortex of an Alzheimer's mouse using the enzyme chondroitinase. Digestion of CSPGs led to a decrease in the amount of A-beta found within that area of the brain, suggesting that CSPGs may be preventing A-beta from being cleared, um, which makes sense. Uh, in the introduction, I showed you a slide which showed that in human patients, A-beta plaques are surrounded by CSPGs, and we know that CSPGs inhibit cells in general from being able to migrate through that area. And so uh, one working hypothesis that CSPGs may be preventing the clearance of A-beta plaques from brains by their effects on microglia and macrophages. Digestion of CSPGs leads to a lower plaque level, as well as increases in cognitive performance. Uh, so I have example here, a uh, CSP uh, chondroitinase injected into an A-beta model of Alzheimer's disease in which we're able to restore the uh, fear memories of these mice. Um, and in this example here, the wild type non-disease are in blue and the diseased are in red. Uh, CHABC is the chondroitinase mouse uh, that was delivered chondroitinase. And then PEN is a penicillinase, which digests penicillin. 
uh, which is not endogenously found in these animals. So this is, is a negative control. And you can see that chondroitinase was able to significantly improve the ability of these mice to uh, remember fearful memories. And so that's an A beta model. Uh, we also have evidence in tau models that were able to enhance cognitive ability by degrading CSPGs. So it's not specific for A beta, but it's specific, but it, it could enhance memory across several different models of Alzheimer's disease. And in this case, I have the example of a tau model of Alzheimer's disease, which were able to restore the ability of novel object recognition in those Alzheimer's disease mice by di digesting CSPGs. So CSPGs and PTP sigma play a role in normal everyday cognition in wild type mice as well. It's not just in disease states. And in this slide, I'll go over a couple examples of what happens to our memories when you either digest CSPGs or you knock out PTP sigma. Uh, the first example, we digested CSPGs um, in a wild type mouse and looked at their ability to recognize novel objects. In the wild type mouse, those that were not treated with chondroitinase and did not have their CSPGs digested begin to forget about the novel object about 24 hours after they've been introduced to the novel object. The animals in which we digested the CSPGs were able to remember the novel object for longer periods of time, out to 48 hours in this example, showing that CSPGs are playing a role in memory consolidation and recall. Now, similarly, in PTP sigma null mice and otherwise wild type backgrounds, we see enhancements in novel object recognition compared to wild type. In uh, mice that have the PTP sigma gene completely knocked out, uh, we also see improvements in novel object recognition in mice that have one working copy of PTP sigma. So haploinsufficiency is also sufficient in order to elicit a cognitive improvement in these otherwise wild type mice. And so this data suggests that CSPGs and PTP sigma play a role in memory consolidation and recall in normal wild type mice. Uh, so I want to move on to let you know where we are as a company in terms of our clinical development. Uh, so we are currently undergoing a phase one clinical trial in healthy volunteers. We have completed our single ascending dose through six different cohorts. Uh, to date, the uh, single ascending dose has been very successful and well tolerated, and we have now began our multiple ascending dose. And for the multiple ascending dose, we will be administering the compounds for 14 days and um, at the doses identified here. Uh, we're beginning our multiple setting dose at a higher dose level um, as justified by the data that we've received with, by the single setting dose study. Uh, to give you an idea of what that data looks like, um, I have down here the pharmacokinetic data that shows a very nice dose response to the uh, bioavailability of the compound. And this pharmaco pharmacokinetic data or PK data is a measurement of the uh, blood levels of the compound, and we see that a uh, very nice distribution of the compound into the blood following a subcutaneous administration, and the PK values are in line or better than what we observed in the rat, uh, which is very exciting for us in terms of translating this to humans. We have longer half-lives uh, in the humans than we do in rodents, uh, which is uh, fantastic. And similarly, the levels at which we are administering are at or have exceeded the human equivalent doses we have used for efficacy studies in rodents. And over here on the, on the right, the amount of compound we've administered through the various different models of nervous system damage and preclinical models and where we are in terms of our clinical trials. And so we are well within or above the therapeutic range already identified in rodents. And I will say that uh, test uh, in the rodent efficacy models, have not been tested at higher doses, so we do not know what the true ceiling effect is of this compound, but it does have a very large range of efficacious doses, as small as 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram up to 0 0.32 milligrams per kilogram. And then our activities for the next year. Um, as I mentioned, we are in, currently in a phase one clinical trial uh, with our multiple ascending dose, and then we will begin a phase two clinical trials of spinal cord injury, Alzheimer's disease, and multiple sclerosis at the end of this year, or early next year. Uh, Preclinically, we are currently investigating our compounds in chronic spinal cord injury, and we also have some ongoing Alzheimer's 
uh, studies uh, to test our compounds. And the stroke data, which I presented in this presentation, um, is under review at a journal and will be published shortly. Uh, so we have a lot of really good data in that paper uh, up and coming, uh, many of which I did not touch on today, uh, but we're very excited for this publication to come out. And with that, I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. DePaul, for that informative presentation. And we will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started. We have some great questions coming in. And uh, <clears throat> our first question, do you envision NVG 291 to replace a standard of care or accompany it? Uh, good question. Uh, so we do not believe that our compound is modifying the disease process. What we're really targeting is the repair falling damage of a disease process. And so we believe that our compound could be used in combination with current standard of care uh, in the clinic. Uh, for example, multiple sclerosis has some really efficient standard of care drugs, which are able to, to quite effectively prevent immune system attacks to the central nervous system. However, there are cases in which the immune system is still able to attack and causes damage. The current standard of care does not address the damage that is caused. It only is only there to prevent the damage from occurring in, in the first place. And so we think we could accompany standard of care in most disease cases and would not be competing with the current standard of care. Thank you so much. And is there a, um, could, could this be applied to TBI? Absolutely. This is something we are very interested in investigating is traumatic brain injury. Uh, so we're, um, it's not part of our core indications. Uh, as you can imagine, our technology has the potential to treat a huge, huge array of different indications. Um, for historical reasons in, in which what the data have supports, we have uh, chosen to first focus on spinal cord injury, multiple, multiple sclerosis, and Alzheimer's disease, uh, but we're actively uh, approaching labs and other sources of funding to investigate non-core areas at, with TBI being at the very top of that list. Thank you. Now, Dr. DePaul, have CSPGs and PTP Sigma been found to play a role in addiction? Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, so CSPGs have been known to play a role in addiction. Uh, so there, the perineuronal net is found in areas of the brain that deal with addiction, and it has been shown that if you digest the CSPGs in those areas of the brain, you can allow reorganization that could potentially uh, alleviate the addictive behaviors. Uh, how PTB Sigma plays a role in this has not been investigated, so we're unsure if PTB Sigma is playing a role in this or if it's CSPGs in general in the perineuronal net, but there is uh, data to suggest that CSPGs are playing a role in the addiction. Thank you. And again, I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. Is there another or other receptor on PTP Sigma that could regulate repair in neurodegenerative damage? And if so, have these been considered in your research? Uh, that's, that's a great question. So PTB Sigma is part of a larger family of receptors known as the LAR family of receptors. It includes three different receptors, LAR, PTP Sigma, and PTP Delta. And all three of these do respond to CSPGs in, in, to some regard, and we've developed compounds against uh, them. And we've tested our compounds against these receptors, and PTP Sigma was found to be the most potent of the three. Uh, so that's within the LAR family receptors. There are other receptors as well that have been known to interact with CSPGs, such as uh, uh, our, uh, such as the NOGO receptor and uh, a few others uh, that were identified prior to PTP Sigma. Uh, but the potency and the concentrations needed to elicit the effect could not adequately explain the effects of CSPGs on the cells. Um, it wasn't until PTP Sigma was discovered and by inhibiting it, you, you observe the effects of cells on CSPGs that it was appreciated that PTP Sigma and the LAR family are likely contributing to many of the 
inhibitory effects that CSPGs are eliciting. Thank you so much. Now, do you see this working to improve smell and taste dysfunction due to COVID-19 infection? Great question. That, yes, that is a great question. It's something that we've discussed um, internally as well. Um, it's potentially, we don't know exactly what is causing the dysfunction to taste and smell in COVID, and it, is, and it does often spontaneously return. Uh, and so if, if it's actually due to some sort of nerve damage, uh, there potentially could be a way for our compound to enhance recovery of smell and taste or other types of brain damage following COVID-19. Uh, we, we just don't know about know enough about the type of damage and the mechanisms at play to uh, answer that adequately, but it is definitely with, within the realm of our technology's capabilities. Now, Dr. DePaul, in the adult brain, a brain plasticity is a good or bad process, and it is ideal to have a high or a low number of perineural nets in the adult brain. Uh, I'm not sure if that was... <laughs> I think I've read about decreasing PNNs in the adult brain, but that seems counterintuitive if PNNs are protective. If CSPGs inhibit adult brain plasticity, is that a bad thing? And so that's a very good question, and there's a lot to unpack here. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, our, our, our drug does not digest CSPGs on a grand, grand scheme of things. It, so it leaves the general architecture of CSPGs intact. So the CP, CSPGs that are upregulated in the collegial scar or those that are found within the perineural nets will remain intact. We don't see widespread degradation with treatment of our compound. Now, the CSPGs may be degraded at the growing axonal tip because as an axon grows, it needs to remove what's in front of it. CSPGs are very dense. Uh, molecule is very negatively charged, and in order to get through it, you need to be able to break it down. And so we do see some degradation of CSPGs as an axon is growing, but only at that growing tip. And uh, so therefore, you would only expect to see CSPGs being degraded in the perineural net where that axon is attempting to make a synapse onto the dendrite or cell body. Uh, but you are absolutely right. The perineural net in the adult brain is protective, and it is there to help uh, solidify those connections which is fantastic in the adult, but not that fantastic in the injury environment. Uh, there was not very strong development or um, evolutionary pressure to allow reorganization of the central nervous system because uh, up until relatively recently, if you had a CNS injury, you were most likely to die because of it. And so there wasn't a long enough period to, for nature to selectively allow um, the nervous system to enhance its plasticity and to regrow those connections. Instead, what the nervous system did was double down on its connections. And after an injury, the nervous system is flooded with a lot of uh, inhibitory molecules and cell types that can cause additional damage, such as a lot of immune cells. And so what the nervous system does is upregulates its perineural net around those synapses to help maintain the synapses that it does has but at the same time, it inhibits potential new connections from occurring. And so what our drug does is, like I said before, it doesn't degrade the CSPGs that are upregulated, so those will be remain intact and can still protect the nervous system. Uh, but it does allow axons that do want to grow and to regenerate to be able to grow and regenerate through these inhibitory areas. Um, and another role that the perineural net makes is to inhibit connections that are not meant to be made. And following de innervation, a cell that was innervated but is no longer de innervated due to an injury will release growth factors and other attracting cues to call axons to innervate it because it wants to be re innervated. However, the axons that grow there are unable to re innervate it due to the perineural net uh, inhibiting those synapses from being made. And so the axons will sit outside the cell body and never actually make contact with the neuron itself. And so our compound allows those axons to penetrate the perineural nets of the neurons that are calling it. And in this way, the growth that is occurring is really guided by the neurons that were de-innervated and are requesting for new connections to be made. Now, if you go ahead and you degrade all the CSPGs in a given area, a lot of the synapses may become uh, less strong and many more neurons may begin requesting additional axons. And so in the case of CSPG degradation, you could get some aberrant sprouting that could 
actually lead to non-efficient circuits or in circuits that could be detrimental. Uh, but in, in our case, since we're not causing widespread degradation, and the innervation is likely occurring due to cells that are requesting the innervation to occur. It's more directed than a general digestion of CSPGs or through general uh, growth factor promoting of regeneration. Thank you so much. A couple more questions that we have time for. Because NVG291 promotes growth, could it potentially allow tumors to grow faster or be cartheogenic? It's, it's, um, so P2P sigma has been identified in certain cancers as a tumor suppressor. Uh, so the answer here is yes. Um, in the central nervous system, oftentimes we look at cancer research and try and do the opposite of what they're doing in, in some regards. Uh, so for example, uh, the, the research that has come around the P10 pathway and the SOX3 pathways, which are very involved in uh, cancer, also appear to play a large role in the ability of these cells to regenerate. It's also important to note that our, our drug um, does not activate the or inhibit the receptor for very long periods of time, and so it's not constantly inhibited. Uh, but P2B sigma is known to be a step in certain cancers, such as colorectal cancer, uh, to be mutated prior to the cancer cells metastasizing or being able to migrate. And so P2B sigma does seem to be a general regulator of migration uh, from many different cell types. Thank you so much. Now, how will dosing differ between acute example CSI, um, I'm sorry, SCI, uh, and chronic example MS or AD conditions? That's a uh, good question. Um, so nervous system damage occurs due to many different reasons, whether it's due to trauma and an acute event like spinal cord injury or due to ongoing disease processes such as multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease. And the needs for our drugs are likely to be quite different between the two diseases. Now our drug causes the central nervous system to reorganize itself. And so the changes that occur in the presence of our drug are expected to persist once the drug is taken away. So in the case of spinal cord injury, we imagine that uh, we could treat for a finite period of time and bring about recovery, and then we could stop treatment and that recovery will be maintained and will no longer be needed to treat that patient. In the case of multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's disease, it's possible that we may need to undergo uh, several different treatment, peri uh, treatment periods. For example, multiple sclerosis. Uh, multiple sclerosis is one of the hallmark characteristics is the attacks that occur that are separated by time. And so uh, in multiple sclerosis, for example, we can envision a treatment paradigm that when an attack occurs, you receive our compound for a certain amount of time and then you're taken off of it and you remain off of the compound until another attack occurs or damage occurs, in which case you can be put back onto our compound to allow the uh, repair of the nervous system. Dr. DePaul, I want to thank you for this presentation today and we've had so many wonderful questions come in. Do you have any closing remarks you'd like to provide our audience before we go today? I just want to thank everybody for this engaging talk. A lot of really great questions, a lot of them that we weren't able to answer today. Um, but please feel free to reach out to the company. Um, we like engaging with the public and, and with patients. We'd like to know how our technology will be used and what patients uh, you know, are, um, are interested in our technology. It helps really drive the conversation at our, our company. So. Uh, please uh, reach out to us if you want more information. Well, I want to thank you again, Dr. DePaul, for your time and for your important research. And before we go, I want to thank our audience again for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And like Dr. DePaul said, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand for two years until March 2024. Labrids will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, everyone, take care and bye-bye. Thank you.